What are we to do in order to conquer this battle? Because it is the greatest battle. There is no greater battle. Even the battle between God and Satan is not greater than this battle. This is the battle that will determine your eternal life. God has won the other battle. Hasn't he? Calvary defeated Satan. Satan knows that he is, his days are counted. Come with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28 to 30. The words of Jesus. Come unto me, all ye that labor in a heavy laden, and I will give you rest. If there is one word that defines the Christian experience, is the word rest. In other words, when we come to Jesus, and he unloads us. If you are laden, if, if you are guilty, if life has burdened you, if sin has, is crashing you down, there is only one remedy for sin and it's found in Christ. You must come to Christ and the result of coming to Christ should be, must be, rest. If your Christian experience is not defined by having a joyful, peaceful assurance and rest in Christ, then you have not come to Christ. You may have come to a religion, you may have come to a set of beliefs, but only Christ can give you rest. And that's why we celebrate the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a joyful reenactment of our salvation. Every seven days, if you have become selfish, if you have become self-centered, every seven days, if you have become legalistic and you are truly keeping the Sabbath, the Sabbath should realign you back to Christ. Because it's the day of rest. It's the day of salvation. The Sabbath teaches you how to receive salvation. You must cease from your works and you must enter God's rest. That's salvation. But sadly, Satan has led us to turn the Sabbath into a legalistic tool in which we define ourselves as righteous and better than others. And so it says, They come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Praise the Lord. That's a promise. And it's a promise for you to receive and call from God's answer. And then it says, verse 30, many well, uh, evangelicals would like to stay on verse 28. But there is a verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. That I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is? What is the religion of Christ like? His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Once you exchange the yoke of sin, the slavery that has made you a slave from all your life, that you have been struggling with the agony, the darkness, the guilt, and you exchange that and Christ puts his yoke on your neck, you go... This is so wonderful. If your religion doesn't give you peace and joy, you have not come to Christ. What is the yoke? Because there is a follow, there's a follow. We must come to Christ. We give him our burdens. He gives us rest, but we do not remain there. Then we must enter into the yoking experience. And the yoking experience, it is then a school where Christ will teach you to be like him. Without the yoking experience, you cannot grow to be like Jesus. You may come to him, you may unburden on him, we call that salvation, but if that's all you do, you remain there, you, that's not the Christian experience. The purpose of the Christian experience, the objective of the Christian experience is to be like Christ. And what is it that Christ wants us to make us like? Like him, in what sense? Meek and lowly in heart. 
What is the yoke? I grew up in a farm in Chile. And uh, when you want to plow the soil, we didn't use tractors. Or when you want to carry a, bi a really big cart, you bring two oxen together or two horses together. And you use a yoke. And you put that around their neck. And these two animals that were independent from each other, through the yoke, they become one. And through the yoke, they will accomplish a common task. And so the yoke is a pairing instrument. And so what Christ is inviting us, is coming to me, all you, so we come to him, we unload, and then he says, I want you to become one with me. I have the yoke already, and I want you to bear it under me. It's my yoke, it's not your yoke. Christ has already borne that yoke, Amen. And so he's inviting us to become one with him. That is the greatest invitation ever given to a sinful rebel like me. You and I can actually become one with Christ. He already has become one with you 2,000 years ago. He took you unto himself. He became your substitute. He lived a perfect life and heaven accounts that life to be your life, that death to be your death. He's, Christ has taken your place. He has joined you to himself. In Christ, you, God and you have become one. You are sitting in heavenly places. You now must be willing to become one with Christ. And in order to do that, you must take the yoke upon your, upon your neck. And then, the rest of your days, Jesus guarantees you that he will teach you to be like him. Isn't that good news? That's what we call sanctification. So through the yoking experience, two animals that were independent from each other, I want you to listen to that word, they're independent from each other, abandon their independence and become one. And so the first thing that the Christian must be willing, in order to become one with Jesus, we must be willing to abandon our independence. Independence is the result of selfishness. In the kingdom of God, there is no independence. God did not create independence. Independence is the, count, the satanic counterfeit for freedom. God created freedom, but he made nothing independent. That's why I don't like the term independent ministries, because that's satanic, it's not divine. God created everything free, but in his kingdom everything is united and dependent one on, on each other, amen? That's why God wants to make us one. You look at nature, everything is dependent on something else, yes or no? Ecosystems. The only part of God's creation, apart from Satan and his angels, that have become independent is human beings. And why are we independent? Because we have a selfish spirit. And selfishness th says, I do not need you, neither I need you. I am quite happy to be by myself. True? And we have gone so independent that we have created a theory that says there is no God, we do not even need our creator. And so Jesus says, if you, want to want, if you must become one with me, the first thing you must abandon, surrender, is your independence. Why? Because in my kingdom, nothing is independent. And so I'd rather use the term faith ministry, supportive ministry, but not independent ministry. Because independent creates a mentality of independence. We do not depend from the conference, and eventually I do not depend with you. And independent ministry fracture and fracture and fracture until they disappear. No independence. We, are, we need each other, friends. doesn't matter if you think different to me. I need you, and you need me. The moment I turn my back on you, I lose. Because God made us to depend with one another. We need, that's why God created a family. That's why God created a church. Because we need one another. 
Amen? We need each other. Let God be the judge. Let him be the one who will give the rewards. In our case, we must push for unity. Push for unity. It's so hard in Adventism because we have an independent spirit. Friends, if this is going to be the final generation, we must cease to be independent. I'll repeat that. If this is going to be the final generation, we must cease to be independent or Christ will have to wait for another generation. And Australia may burn to the ground, the whole of Australia. And, and New Zealand may suffer horrible consequences. But God cannot finish his work until he has a people who are completely united in Christ. Amen. True? True? Yes. yes. So what is the yoke? The yoke is the uniting experience with Christ where I submit all to him and I cease to be independent from him that he may accomplish the work of recreating his image in me. Amen? In the book of Matthew, chapter 10, the apostle uh, Matthew presents to us this experience from another perspective. Matthew chapter 10, verse 38 says, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He, does, he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. In other words, we cannot follow Jesus unless we take up the cross. In other words, friends, for every Christian, for everyone, for every disciple, there is a cross that we must take. And in the book of Matthew, chapter 16, Jesus speaks of this, uh, this experience in the, uh, adding an element. <clears throat> Matthew, chapter 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Again, Christ speaks of this experience. So important, so valuable, so essential. Without it, we cannot be followers, disciples of Jesus. And Mrs. White says that the cross and the yoke are one and the same experience. You see, friends, when you look at a cross, every cross has two faces, true? Every cross has two sides, true? Every cross has two faces on one hangs Jesus, but the other is empty. Who must hang on that side? Us. Jesus says that we are to take the cross as much as he was willing to take the cross. And once we take the cross, then we become his disciples. And then we can follow him and we are to deny self. There's two experiences to the yoke. There is the experience of taking up the yoke or the cross. And then there is the experience of denying self. And we are going to look at these two experiences because they are one. Both are represented by the yoke. And it is here where God has given us the science to defeat self. I'll repeat that. It is through the, 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 the yoking up experience or the crucifying experience that God has given us the science, the secret for the defeating of self. Come with me to the book of, to the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Paul speaks of this experience. It was the experience that every Christian, true Christian, has gone through. It is the experience that gave power to the early church. And it is the experience that is lacking in modern day Christianity for which we lack the power that early Christianity had. Paul speaks of it in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. We are going to try to define, speak of the cross. 
It says there in verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And in the original it says, I have been crucified with Christ, past. I no longer live, present, but Christ lives in me. So friends, Paul could look back to a, a, a past experience where he knew he was crucified with Christ. Not literally, not physically. But there is a spiritual experience by which Paul heard the call of Jesus, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. And Paul was willing to take up the cross and he accounts that experience as being crucified with Christ. And then he says that that past experience is repeated daily in the present in which I no longer live. In other words, I have died. Self has been crucified. What is the cross? The cross is an instrument of death. Isn't it? Yes. The cross is an instrument of death. In other words, when Jesus calls us to take up the cross, what is he calling us to? He's calling us to death. God wants us to die. That's the reality. And that death must be repeated every day of our life in our present experience. Why? Because it must be Christ who lives, not me. And dear friends, here is where modern day Christianity has completely missed the mark. In today's Christianity, there is no cross, there is no yoke. And even in Adventism, Oh yes, friends, we have laid burdens upon our, uh, upon our believers. We have tried to make up the cross by telling them they need to do this, 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 this and that. And the whole Christian life becomes a life in, of do's and don'ts that I have to accomplish, that I have to uh, you know, achieve in order for me to know that I am a follower of Christ. But that is not the cross. The cross is absolute and foremost the death of self. How can that be? That's what we're going to try to discover in our series together. In the book of Colossians, the apostle speaking to the Colossians says this. Colossians chapter 2. We know Colossians well for the verses that speak regarding the Sabbath. But here, in verse 20, the apostle says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ, from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Did you notice what had happened with the Colossians? What, had, what was the experience of the Colossians? Paul could say to the Colossians, you have died with Christ. And then chapter 3 says, if ye then being risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Verse 3, again he repeats, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. What is Paul trying to say? Paul is telling the, the Colossians that they have actually died. And their life is in Christ, hidden until he appears again. And we will not appear again until Christ returns. Then, and only then, we shall live again. In the Christian life, there's some funny things. If you want to be free, you've got to become a slave. If you want to live, you must die. Wow. 
So Paul, the Bible, as a matter of fact, Mrs. White says that the death of self, it is the very essence of the teachings of Christ. It is the very reason why Christ gave us the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ demands the death of self. And yet, we talk about it, we speak about it, but how little we know about it. And even less how little it is practiced in the daily life. In Romans chapter 6, it is the chapter where Paul expounds himself more than in any other part of the scriptures regarding this topic. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then, Paul says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That is the call of liberalism, isn't it? Let us just sin, we have grace. What Paul says, God forbid. So the conservative element comes and says, we must have victory. We cannot keep sinning where there is victory over sin. And since I was this little, I grew up in the Adventist church, pr the preaching is that we must have victory. We must have victory. We must conquer. If Jesus is going to come, we must conquer every sin and so on and on. And I believe it. But no one ever, ever told me how. And it drove me nuts. I was a good kid. I, I wanted to serve the Lord. I wanted to overcome my sins, but I never could. And so I was a slave, but hidden. I could not tell the church that I was a slave to sin. They'll, they'll, they'll throw me out. And here is the secret. It's so simple. Verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. No way, he's saying. How shall we that are, what is the next word? Dead. What are we? Dead. What are we? Dead to sin. Live any longer in it. That is the message of Adventism, isn't it? Yes or no? That is the message of Adventism, that sanctification. How can we continue living in sin when Jesus is coming? He must have a pure bride, a perfect bride, who has developed a wonderful character in the likeness of Jesus. And we all say, Amen. And then the preacher sits, and we all go, but how? How can I give up my addictions? How can I give up my temper, my pride? How can I give up, friends, that which is holding me by the neck and I have been fighting and denying it for 20 years? I am a miserable Christian. I yet at church, I've got a big smile and I'd rather argue against the Trinity and women's ordination and worship styles than deal with the real issues that are struggling in my own soul. How? And then Paul says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him into baptism, into death, that like as Christ, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So God here has given us the science, the formula, by which he actually transforms a human being. And it's a threefold step science. What is baptism? Baptism is a burial ceremony, isn't it? Yes? That's why we bury people. Why are we burying them? Because we are burying them. We, we, we immerse them because... We don't, we don't, when people die, we don't bury them with a little bit of earth on their head. We hide them on the earth, true? And what is the only condition to bury someone? There's only one condition for someone to be buried. They need to be there. Let's say that my wife died. Hopefully she will not die. One day she will. But she is here and I'm, I'm conducting the, the burial, the ceremony. And I say, 
We have gathered together to farewell our dear sister Mary, and suddenly she goes, whoo, he's hot in here, and she kicks the lid of the, of the coffin, and boom, opens up, and says, whoo, can, can a deacon give me some water, please? And I say, brothers and sisters, our, 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 our Mary has become a little bit unruly. Deacons, come here, don't bring any water, and they come and they and close the lid. And so they close the lid, and she says, no, 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 please, don't close the lid, it's too hot. I promise you keep the lid open, I won't speak anymore. No, no, just close the lid. And they tie it with, with, with some rubber things, you know, and it's, it's really, but she's screaming, please, don't, don't, please, it's so hot in here, I'm so thirsty, please, don't, don't. And says, well, the, since she has become a bit unruly, we are going straight to the cemetery. And we all gather, we take the coffin, and we go to the cemetery, and we bury her and cover her in dirt. Was that a funeral? What was that? What was that? A murder. But we did all the right things. What is the only condition for someone to be buried? And they need to be so dead that we test them for three days. True? At least in Australia. What is the only condition for someone to be baptized? They need to be dead. They need to have died with Christ. That's crucifixion. That's the yoke. It's the abandonment of who I am and my independence and everything that has defined me is the abandonment of that in order to be joined to Christ. And in order to be joined to Christ, I need to go through a threefold experience. I must die. When I die and the death is certain, then I must be buried. And once I'm buried with Christ, then I am res- I'm going to resurrect with him and his life is guaranteed. Notice what it says in verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Did, Did you notice the promise? Did you notice the promise? What is the promise? That if you and I join Jesus in death, we become one with him on his cross, and then we are buried with him, then when we are resurrected, we will have the life of Jesus after his resurrection. Isn't that what you want? But what is the problem, friends? Why is it that most people, I was eight years into my pastoral ministry when I was converted. Eight years into ministry when I I, I went through this experience and I tell you, it works. It's marvelous. Things that for years had held me captive began to fall by the wayside. Why is it that we have no power against sin? It's because we have not the power of the resurrected Christ. Friends, if we want the life of Jesus, Do you want the life of Jesus? You must first have his death and his burial. Then we are given the life of Christ. And you read the rest of chapter 6, and the rest of chapter 6 is a full promise of freedom. We are no longer slaves of sin. Doesn't it say that? Only when you have the fullness of the life of Christ. But Christ cannot rule the heart that is still ruled by self. If self is your master, then Christ is not. And how do we know? If Christ is my master or self is my master, let me ask you a question. Whose will do you do? Of whom do you love speaking on Sabbath afternoons during the week? When was the last time that you actually shared your testimony with someone who was lost? Who owns your possessions? Who owns your bank account? Friends, either Christ is Lord or you are Lord. The throne is not shared. Why? Because self will never share it. Oh, but self 
is a master in masquerading. And the greatest masquerade that self uses is religion. When self hears of death, self will do all kinds of good things to make you believe that you are a Christian. Look at, look at the Pharisee in Luke chapter 18. That man prays many times a day. He fasts a number of times a week. He gives a tithe of everything. That man is convinced by self that he is a good son of Abraham. That he is accepted by God. And yet the God of heaven accepts the tax collector and rejects him. He goes home thinking that he is better than the tax collector. Yet in heaven, the tax collector is a righteous man. And the Pharisee is a sinner, unforgiven, lost. Self has deceived him. True? That man was so religious. He was conservative. Oh, he was very conservative. And then you had the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the liberals. Both cases, the heart was ruled by self. And when it came time, they united to kill Jesus. Why? Because self will not allow someone else to rule the heart. Oh, self will make you believe you're a good Christian. You can pay tithe, keep the Sabbath, you can do all those things as long as you do not surrender to Christ. When you surrender to Christ, that's when the battle begins. Because self does not want to die. And it will not die unless we make a conscious decision to be yoked up with Christ. In the book of John, Jesus speaks of this, of this experience in a parable. <clears throat> Certain Greeks came to, to see Jesus. They wanted to meet him, and Jesus could not meet. So he sent a message through to apostles. And in that message is contained everything they needed to know in order to have salvation. John 12, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn or a seed of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it dies, what does it do? It bringeth forth much fruit. Now the first application is to himself. The second application is to us. Do you want to bring the fruits of the character of Jesus? Do you want to be like him? Do you want to be with much fruit? Yes or no? Yes, that's what we want. What must we do? We must fall to the ground. That's justification by faith where the Lord humbles us when he allows you to see that you are poor, that you have nothing to give him, that you cannot earn it, that you cannot obey, that all your righteousness is like filthy rag. You have fallen to the ground. And the next thing is you must die. And when you die, what is the rational thing to do? What do we do when we plant seeds? We make a little hole, we plant it, and then we cover it. You are practicing the gospel. And then you, we water it, we look after it, and what does it do with it? Spring back. And when it springs back, it has come back in a new life. Yes or no? And what will that new life do? It will grow, grow. How? Naturally. It doesn't have to be forced. It doesn't have to be reminded. It grows natural, natural, natural. Because the great God of heaven is looking after it. And eventually, what does it do? It produces fruit when it matures. And when the time of harvest comes, the fruit is harvested. There is the lesson. Friends, the greatest blessing that God can do to us is to humble us, is to open our eyes that we may see our wickedness, that we may see how short we, we, we have fallen, how far we have gone, even all the years we've been in the church, how unfaithful we have been. 
Let, that's what we should be crying for. Lord, open my eyes. May I, like Isaiah, see your glory. And when I see your glory, cry aloud, Whoa, whoa, is me. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The greatest blessing the Lord can give you is to show you how poor, how miserable you are. That there is nothing you can offer him. That you have nothing in yourself to give him. That there is, you are absolutely bankrupt. And that the Lord expects you to give him nothing. But he demands that you take everything from him. Because he has provided everything in Christ Jesus, friends. And the first lesson the Christian must learn is that the only way you can live the Christian life is crucified, dead. So that Christ can live. When we learn that lesson as a people, then the world will know. Then they will hear the glory of God. Or they will hear the three angels' messages and they will see the glory of God reflected in us. Why? Because God wants us to, pre God wants us to be presented before him perfect in Christ. Not I, but Christ. What is the cross? When Christ Jesus took the cross, he took the cross well back in eternity. Didn't he? And what did it mean? When the plan of redemption was formulated and Christ was existing with the Father and the Holy Spirit as eternal God, the plan of redemption was going to need a redeemer. And so... He emptied himself and surrendered himself, chose himself to become the son of God. And God declared him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And Jesus became the redeemer. He existed until his birth on earth as the son of God. He did not exist as God, he existed as the son of God, though by nature he was God. Do you, do you see that? And then, that's the first time he took up the cross. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. He died to who he was. He abandoned that which was naturally his for love of us. Amen? And then, again, he took up the cross when he left that position and he became the son of of man, again he humbled himself and became a servant, a slave. And came to live under the law to receive the curse of the law, friends. That's the cross. And then as a human being, he constantly denied himself. He never worked one miracle with his own powers. He depended on his father as you and I must depend on him. He lived as a man and he denied who he was in order to be a man. True? He was tempted. He was, he was persecuted by Satan at every step. Them. There was not a moment in his life when he had respite from the moment that he was born all the way until Calvary. He was constantly assailed by temptations that you and I will never face. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. He could have gone and he would have converted that desert into a marvelous forest full of fruits for him to eat. No. Not one miracle to satisfy his needs because he was a man. And an amazing saviour. And then he came to Gethsemane. He came to Gethsemane. And there the greatest struggle ever fought. Self was saying, no. How will you die for these people? Look at them, they are sleeping. They will abandon you. One will betray you. Self was rebelling. Self did not want to go. But what was... Jesus' words, not my will, but your will. That's the cross. The cross, the physical cross, is a result of a decision. 
His physical death was a result of a commitment. What was the commitment? Not my will, Father, but your will. In other words, he surrendered his will so that God could work his will through him and go all the way in obedience to do that which was the will of God. And the will of God entailed rejection, spitting, false accusations, beating scourging, nailing, and then complete abandonment from God so that he could develop perfect faith. Friends, what is the cross? It's death to self. In what sense? is the abandonment of my independence. It is a complete commitment to the will of God where I surrender my will, my ways, my thinking. I give them to God and I commit myself completely to the will and ways of the Lord. That's death. Because I will no longer rule my life. Mrs. White says that God takes our will and you know what he, did, what he does with it? He doesn't destroy it. He cannot destroy it because he made us free beings. But we have chosen. This is not based on feelings. This is not based on a nice music and made you cry and suddenly you go, oh yeah, now I can, I accept Jesus as my savior. This is the biggest decision of your life. This is the most important decision of your life. Feelings must not have anything to do with it. You must think, you must balance it, you must reason it, and you must come to the conclusion, do I want Christ? Do I want him? Do I love him enough? So that I will cease to be, so that he may take my place. God takes that will joins it to his, the Bible says, returns it to us, and from then on, he will both work and will through us to accomplish his good pleasure. Isn't that beautiful? Then the heart begins to beat in the harmony of God's heart. Amen? Then the mind begins to flow with the thoughts of of God and that which we used to hate now we love and that which we love now we hate and friends suddenly a whole turn of events takes place and it seems that it's we who have accomplished it but not is God in us and through us because he never does it without the human being let me ask you a question how much can a dead person help nothing so how can we Cooperate with God only as he lives his life through us and compels us to cooperate with him. By the way, I know that we mean well, but we have to be very careful when we say that God will help us. Because when we say that, self takes it, self-sufficiency says, oh well, I am in charge, I only need God when I need him. If I am poor, if I am wretched, if I am bankrupt, I don't need God's help. I need him. I need him to be the one who takes over, who will manage and guide and, 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 and work from within me and even cause me enable, him, enable me to cooperate with him. I am the one who helps him. It is not the one, him, who helps me. He is in charge of the development of the character. He is in charge of the transformation, the victory. He is in charge. If he is not in charge, I will never be able to do it. True or not? Yes or no? Yes, dear friends. And so I submit to him. I say, Father, from now on, your will, whatever it takes, whether it be poverty, whether it be rejection, if you want, me to, if you want to take me to an early grave, it's fine with me, Father. Now you are in charge of my life. I am dead. I will cooperate with you as far as I am able to. Because we continue to live, as Paul said it. But now our life is hidden in Christ. It's Christ who lives. Isn't that what we want? Amen? Dear friends, 
And then Jesus said, but we are not only to take the cross, but then we are also to deny self. This is not deny, well, I like cheese, but I'm going to deny myself, I'm not going to eat cheese. No, we are to do that, but that's not the denial that the Bible is talking about. The denial is actually you deny yourself. And Jesus gave us an example when he said to Peter, Peter, tonight before the rooster crows three, you know, three times, no, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Do you remember the words that Peter used when he denied Jesus? I do not know that man. And then he used cursing words and he repeated, I do not know that man. That's what it means to deny. And now Jesus says, I don't want you to deny me. I want you to deny yourself. What does that mean? That the Christian will have nothing to do with self. From now on, it is what the Lord says. It is his thoughts, it is his plans, it is his desires, it is his ideas. Why? Because I have died. I will have nothing to do with Pastor Sam. My opinions don't count. My desires don't count. A dead person has no rights. True or not? Yeah, we die to our rights, we die to our possessions, we die to everything we are. And it's written, isn't it? Luke chapter 14. Jesus says it so clear. Verse 27. He says, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then Jesus tells two parables. The parable of the man who intends to build a tower. Remember the story? And the, pan of the, uh, the, pa uh, the parable of the king who is going to go to war, remember? And what is the lesson of those two parables? Before you do it, count the cost. Why count the cost? Because Jesus says there in verse 33, So likewise, whoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Count the cost. And so, friends, when I preach, when I run evangelistic programs, I do not make the thing emotional because I want people to count the cost. Why? Because the cross demands a question. The cross demands the question, the same question that Jesus had to ask himself at Gethsemane. How much do I love them? How much do I love them? And now the question falls on us. How much do we love him? And as he was willing to abandon everything he has and was in order to go to Calvary and to die for you, friends, you and I must look at Jesus and ask the question, how much do I love him? Why would you commit to something for which you are not willing to give it all? Christianity demands Everything. Adventism demands everything, otherwise we'll never go to heaven. Amen? A complete, absolute commitment to the will of Christ. An absolute surrender all of our lives to Jesus, friends. It demands everything. If you are dead, your houses, your possessions, your whatever it is, it's no longer yours. You no longer have a right. You no longer have an, a self-image that to protect from now on, if they slap you on one cheek, put the other. You must love your enemies. You must pray for those who persecute you. You must bless those who curse you. The life of Christ. Wow. And let me tell you, it's beautiful. There's nothing more beautiful, but there's nothing more scary. I had a friend who came to one of my programs and she wanted to commit suicide. She spoke to me and said, Sam, I, uh, things were going really bad in her family and she was thinking to commit suicide. And I said to her, look, participate of this week and after that you can commit suicide if you want. But that I knew what was going to happen. After the first night when she heard this message, she surrendered to the Lord and her whole life was filled with peace and joy. The problems did not change. But now, Christ was abiding in the soul, you see. There was peace, there was joy. Yes, it's scary on that side, 
but it's beautiful when you cross the gate. This is the narrow gate. This is where you must count. Many want to enter, but they don't find it. Why? Because they are not willing to give up self. They love selfishness. But those who will enter are those who look at Christ and they say, He is worth it. He is worth it. And I want Him more than I want myself. Lord, and they become one with Him. That decision is the crossing of the gate. And then that must be repeated how often? Daily. Daily. I must die daily. Every time a decision comes, not I, but Christ. Every time a temptation comes, not I, but Christ. A struggle, not I, but Christ. The constant submission of self. And in this, there is marvelous freedom and victory. Let me finish with three examples. Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler? The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and says, Good Lord, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Remember the story. It's, in, it's found in Mark chapter 10. Do you remember the story, the, the, the answer of Jesus? Why do you call me good? There is none good but God. Did that mean that Jesus was not good? Does that mean that Jesus was not good? Friends, what nature had Jesus taken? Our nature. Therefore, he saw himself as not good. Only his father was good. Wow. Let me ask you a question. What right do we have to think of ourselves as being good? And to think, I am better than thou. I am vegan, therefore I am better than you, that you are vegetarian. And the vegetarian looks down on the one who eats meat and says, I am better than you, that you eat meat. And the one who eats meat looks down on the one drinking coffee and says, I am better than you than drinking coffee. And the one who drinks coffee looks down on the one who drinks wine and says, I am better than you than drinking wine. And we have better than thou attitude. Friends, if Jesus said the only one who is God, good is God, shouldn't we have that mindset? And Mrs. White says, the closer we come to Jesus, what will, ha- what will happen with us? The more filthy and wicked we will see ourselves. So the clearest sign that you are walking with the Lord is this beautiful sense of, I am at rest, I am at peace. Is everything fine with Christ? But I have nothing good in me. And there will never be a time on this side of eternity where you and I will think that we are good. Only Christ, Christ, He is our goodness. Amen? Amen. And we must rejoice in Him, not in us. There's nothing to rejoice in us. Rejoice in the Lord, Paul says. And again I say rejoice. When I look at Christ and I see that He took my place, that He is my life, that He is my righteousness, that He is my my sanctification, I rejoice in Him, not in me. Because I have brought in shame and pain. I have insulted him and I have turned my back on him. What is there for me to rejoice in me? Nothing. But I have eternal source of rejoicing in my Savior Jesus. There in Mark chapter 10, Jesus says to this rich young ruler, he says, Then Jesus, verse 21, behold him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, deny yourself. And give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Can you see the condition? The text says that, this, that Jesus loved this man. We do not even know his name, and he will not be in heaven. Why? Because he was not willing to fulfill the condition. He looked at Jesus, he looked at his riches, and for him, his riches. And let me tell you, the spiritual riches that this man had were more blinding than the physical riches that this man had. True? Jesus says, keep the commandment. What does this man say? All that I have done since I am a young man. That was his spiritual riches. He thought that he was a good man. And yet, he'll be lost forever. A commandment-keeping young man who is lost 
because Jesus was not precious enough for him to take up the cross and abandon everything. There's another rich young man. Do you know his name? Paul. Paul is another rich young man. Did you know that? He is the one who replaced the rich young ruler. He was rich, he was a ruler, and he was young. And in the book of Philippians, he tells us his own experience. He had the same situation as the rich young ruler. He was rich spiritually. Wasn't he? Yes, he trusted in, in that which he had. Chapter th uh, 3 of Philippians, uh, the apostle writes there in verse 5, says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. There you have him, rich, self-confident, blinded by his selfishness. He thought himself a good man until he came to Christ. That day on the road to Damascus, when Paul meets Jesus face to face, now he has an option to make. He has to choose. Who will he follow? Will he continue to follow his own religion? Or will he surrender it all, give it all up for Christ? Who is more precious? And he looked at Christ and for Paul. Notice what he says then. He tells us. He says, but what things were gained to me, this I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And what does he say then? And I count them as done that I may gain Christ. Can you see? Can you see the attitude of the apostle? For him, Christ was precious, wasn't he? He had found the pearl of great price, and when he found the pearl of great price, he was willing to let go of everything, sold everything, in order to find, to have that pearl. Are we willing, or are we trading with Jesus? Surely not that one, Lord. Come on, not this one. And self is having the mastery. Unless there is a complete commitment to Christ. Unless we love him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and with all our strength, Christianity is not worth living, friends. It's an absolute commitment to Christ or an absolute commitment to self. You must choose the master. I have chosen mine. And for Christ, like Paul, I have lost it all. And you know what? My wife and I counted as dang. We are so glad that he had taken it all because he alone has become precious. Precious. Beautiful. There is, do you know that there is another rich young ruler? The third one is called Laodicea. Laodicea is young and it will become a ruler. True? But only if she is willing to give up her riches and adopt the position of absolute poverty and wretchedness that she may have Christ. You and I stand on the threshold of the narrow gate and sadly we are infested with Phariseeism. The belief that things, I am rich, increasing goods, and need of nothing. I have kept all those things since my youth. And Jesus stands on the other side and says, How precious am I to you? Are you willing to be yoked up with me? Are you willing to take up the cross, denying self to follow me?